Mr. President. Mr. President, I can start my contribution here today by giving an assurance without any fear of contradiction whatsoever, as not only the past actions will show, as at this stage, but also in the future, history will show that this government has never done anything to jeopardize the energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago, that it, that it painstakingly began building many, many decades ago. Mr. President, I thank you for the opportunity and for the members of this Senate for the opportunity to spend a few moments here today providing some necessary details. And I think the best way to start, Mr. President, is by just putting things into context so we can understand exactly what it is we're dealing with. First of all, we in Trinidad and Tobago have a very long history in the hydrocarbon sector. We've been exploiting, that is exploring and producing oil on a commercial basis for well over one century. Gas, natural gas, natural gas we began using for power generation first in 1953. And by the end of the 1950s, Mr. President, it was being used in the production of cement and ammonia. In 1975, the National Gas Company that we've heard referred to a few times today was incorporated on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And thankfully today, under good stewardship and leadership, it continues to do its job on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So Mr. President, in a nutshell, for over five decades, we have developed a very sophisticated natural gas sector. That natural gas sector, meaning all of the natural gas that is currently produced in Trinidad and Tobago, and for the last few decades, goes into one of three places. It either goes into the production of liquefied natural gas, LNG, at Atlantic LNG, it goes into the production of power generation, and we are one of the only, well, the only country in the whole CARICOM region that 99.9% .9 of our electricity is generated by natural gas, and then it goes into the production of what we call pet chems, petroleum chemicals in Trinidad, ammonia, methanol, urea, UAN. Trinidad and Tobago, senators, is globally recognized globally recognized for its well-developed gas-based industry and sector. I am quite proud as a citizen from my experience in the last eight years, the number of countries that turn to Trinidad and Tobago for guidance and for us to express our experiences to them, including within recent times, a number of our African sisters and brothers who come here on study tours of Trinidad as they begin to find, and hopefully for them, exploit their hydrocarbon resources. They come to us to ask, how was it built? How do you negotiate? What are the pitfalls to look out for? Mr. President, it was in 1979 that the government took a decision to capture and monetize flared offshore gas from the teak salmon puy field, and this is the birth of what has become and developed into this globally recognized gas-based industry. Power generation and growth and development of the pet chem sector really took place and spurned from the 1980s with ammonia, methanol, urea, and steel production. The, the gas value chain that we discussed that, Mr. President, through you, we in the population need to understand. You start by the extraction of gas from the well those are the molecules of gas. That is done in Trinidad and Tobago by a number of multinational upstream players. Shell is one. BP is another, two of the largest in the world. We have smaller, nimble, but well-recognized companies like EOG, the giant of, from Australia, Woodside. And I'd like to say that we need to protect our relationships with these multinationals, because we never, unlike Malaysia, who developed Petronas, we never developed that ability decades ago to do the exploration and production offshore of gas in these fields that we've had. So we must protect very, very carefully the relationships 
we have with these com companies as they continue to invest globally. We are always competing globally for their capital to be invested in Trinidad and Tobago. And they protect and they very jealously guard their brands and their brand protection. However, I am also proud to state that this government's record is that we don't stand in fear or apprehension, but only respect of these companies. And in fact, in 2018, the record reflects, we took them on, we said we need fairer gas prices, fairer gas deals, we don't think we're getting our fair share, there is enough for everybody to get returns, for us, for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and for them and their shareholders. And we have successfully renegotiated over the last five years much better terms and conditions for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is a fact and something I'm very proud of. So this is the context within which we're operating. The point is natural gas is the feedstock for this gas sector that we must do everything we can to protect, but always to ensure we get the best returns for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is something that we believe very strongly in and on in this side of the government for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Our energy sector counts for over 35% of the GDP, the gross domestic product of Trinidad and Tobago, and over 80% of our country's exports. That LNG, that ammonia, that methanol. In fact, as of 2021, which is the year that they last had the global statistics, Trinidad and Tobago is the second largest exporter of methanol in the world, only behind Saudi Arabia, and the second largest exporter of ammonia in the world, only behind Russia, 2021. And the feedstock for both of those products are natural gas. As I said, we have been exploiting our natural resources for well over a century. We are a small province. We don't have the expanse of a Saudi Arabia, even of a Venezuela, a United States, a Canada. So we're within our boundaries, when you've been exploiting your resources for over 100 years, they are going to decline. It is critical that we, the citizens, do everything we possibly can to protect Trinidad and Tobago's reputation and credibility at every step in the way. And that is something I personally take very, very seriously. And we will jealously protect it and guard it. And in the energy sector, this is what you trade in, literally at times, a person's credibility and a person's reputation, meaning the country's reputation and its credibility, to uphold sanctity of contracts, to uphold what takes place in a very competitive sector. Because you see, this isn't like the grocery, where it's one grocery competing with another on the corner. We are in this global energy sector that you have other countries competing with Trinidad and Tobago to attract the resources of these multinationals to attract their capital. So you're constantly competing with other countries as to whether you can bring the capital to Trinidad and Tobago or whether it goes elsewhere in Qatar, in Australia, in Malaysia, and elsewhere. And the component of confidentiality, no matter how we try to water it down, is a reality of these contracts. And just to give a brief explanation, as I'm sure all of the senators understand, but for those, Mr. President, who may be listening, why confidentiality is critical in this competitive environment is, and we can just use our industrial estate here in Point Lisas, where you have different producers, for example, of ammonia. If plant A that is owned by A and plant B that is owned by B go to NGC as they do, or National Gas Company, for gas, you will negotiate different prices with them. There are different factors that you'll take into consideration. One plant may get a better price than another. And if these things are now made open and you breach the confidentiality, it will lead to disarray. I can say here without fear of contradiction, because I have been the one tasked with the very difficult task at times of going to Venezuela and maintaining the relationship. So all those trips that we heard about 
are never for me personally, but it's for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I can tell you, in the height of sanctions, the worst of the sanctions against Venezuela, when I had gone there and you're driving through the streets and you're seeing the actions taking place on the streets, the people I know, because of the difficulties put on the people of Venezuela by sanctions, it was not a good feeling. It was not a good experience, but it was an experience. And I can tell you now that sanctions have opened up. Within recent times, the United States, the Treasury Department have issued what you call a general OFAC license. It doesn't affect us in Trinidad and Tobago, as I'll come to in a short while. So when you heard the opposition and the opposition agents recently come out and say Trinidad's license will expire in April of next year, and as I just heard the previous speaker, Senator Mark, talk about doom and gloom, if certain things don't happen, that our OFAC license will be affected. That's simply not true. But now that the United States have issued a general license that expires in April of next year, as compared to ours that I'll get into a short period, when I go to Venezuela within the last few months, I would say since the beginning of, since the end of the first quarter of this year, we are no longer the single game in town. You come out of the negotiation room, for example, at Pedavesa, and you see global energy players, I won't call their names here, but global multinational energy players waiting to enter into the same room to negotiate deals. And that is the reason why this is so critical to be protected, the confidentiality, because the deal that we will get from Venezuela will differ to the deal that a European company will get. And I can tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago here without fear of contradiction once again, that this deal that is not yet across the line, but we're very, very close, very, very close, would own, has only happened as a result of the management by this government of its relationships, for example, with the United States and of its relationship with the government of Venezuela. And that is why we were the first after Chevron to be granted a license, an OFAC license by the United States. That is a fact. No amount of screaming can change that. And Chevron's initial license was for three months. Trinidad and Tobago's initial license, and I'll get it, the OFAC license, was for two years, which is the maximum that the US Treasury Department, through the OFAC Department, grants. That says a lot, and that only came about, as I will get into some level of detail, as a result of this government's careful strategic planning and implementation of the political conversations and other conversations we had with the broadest spectrum of the decision makers in the United States, starting from the president, President Biden, Vice President Harris, come down as I will give some level of detail. So senators, respectfully, we are not trying to hide anything. At every single stage that the government can provide information, the record shows that we have. A certain senator told me a short while ago that they read a speech that actually took 14 hours to write that was delivered in Miami of this year, and it was very lengthy. It took over two, almost two hours to deliver, but it is a chronicle of what has taken place in the energy sector in a great level of detail from 2015 to now. At every time we can provide information, we engage the population. In this instance, from the highest level, the prime minister, to myself as the minister of energy, and I will give the examples. It is very important, we heard a lot about gas production, so I've said that gas is the feedstock of this industry. If that disappears, the landscape and our lifestyles in Trinidad and Tobago will be drastically changed. We have become accustomed to living on a hydrocarbon-based economy, and the government from day one in 2015 to now has worked hard from no less a level than the highest level, the office of the prime minister, to ensure that this future is maintained. Not to say, Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, Minister. Um, I, 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 just for my own edification, um, I think 
I would like to draw your attention on some of these, what I see as the key issues coming out of this motion and what Senator Marcus said. I don't see much traction about the closure of heritage. That's really not part of the, the debate motion. I don't see anybody's going to argue about the need for confidentiality and the need to maintain sensitive information whilst negotiations are ongoing. However, I think Senator Mark has raised issues. The US has granted a license. Is that license in peril if Venezuela invades the Essequibo region or it fails to have the general elections as was agreed? I think that's a matter we need to hear. Secondly, right. what is your role as lead negotiator on behalf of T Trinidad and Tobago and whether or not that extends to being able to speak on behalf of companies which are not part of the state but are companies in their own right and separate. Um, so like National Gas Company. Okay, Senator Vera, with the greatest of respect, those are issues that will be addressed and I, I will certainly address them. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, and thanks for the guidance as to where your thought pattern is. So Trinidad and Tobago, we've been exploiting our resources for over 100, and, 100 years, including the use and commercialization of gas for the past five decades. Let's put it in context. Our gas production in 2006 was 3.8 BCF, billion cubic feet a day. 2007 to 2008, it went up to 4 4.086 BCF. In 2009, 4.2 BCF. In 2010, it was the highest level of gas production Trinidad and Tobago has ever had at 4.3 BCF. A point that needs to be appreciated, and I'm certain it is appreciated by those in the Senate and also the population, is when you negotiate a gas contract, a gas sales contract, a, a production sharing license, um, production sharing contract or an ENP license. It doesn't happen today. The production doesn't happen today. So you have to constantly be working on where will future production come from. And that does not depend on incentives provided by a government which directly affect revenues. So in other words, if you fail to negotiate gas sales contracts, you fail to negotiate for future drilling, et cetera, and you go through a period where that does not take place or it is not set up for the future, there will be additional declines in additional to natural declines. So in 2010, we were at 4.3. The decline began immediately. In 2011 to 2013, we dropped to 4.1. That is 200 million scuffs of gas a day dropped off. That is going to affect plants. That started in 2011. In 2014, it dropped to four BCF. In 2015, 3.8, the decline was going on and nothing was being done to arrest that decline. The decline could not immediately be stopped because of course, if nothing is done, there's nothing coming down, no pun intended, through the pipeline. So I put us in that gas context. So we are now faced with a situation where what can you do in the short term to get additional gas when you're a mature province? And immediately upon coming into government and realizing that we had been hoodwinked because we were being told it was maintenance when this decline began in 2011 and realizing it was not maintenance, but it was actually a set decline and a trajectory that would continue going downwards, the government began to look around and decide what needed to be done. And the answer is literally next door. Venezuela sits on the largest oil reserves in the world and they have significant proven gas reserves. So with the drag on field, you don't need to go and do exploration. You don't need to go and test. You don't need to go and see where you can find the gas. We literally know where that is and you will see how critical that then becomes. So in 2015, late 2015 and 2016, the Honorable Prime Minister, I was part of it, the Minister of Energy at the time, saw the need to begin planning for the future. If we're going to continue having a future in Trinidad and Tobago, and we began planning with respect to Loran Manatee, which is a 10 TCF field, as well as Dragon, which is what we call a cross-border gas. It has never been done in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And we focused effort 
not only on Dragon. I heard Senator Mark ask about, tell us about Loran Manatee. The population would be aware because it is there. We have said it many, many times. We are pursuing manatee. The irony of that is if you go today and you do a quick search, you will see just today, McDermott has announced to the world that they have gotten a contract from Shell to build the infrastructure, construct the infrastructure for the gas from Manatee. That is a direct result of the work we have done. I said two years ago when we completed the negotiation of a new PSC, production sharing contract with Shell for Manatee, it was going to be done then. I said before then, the Prime Minister said before then, we had negotiated with President Maduro to be permitted to de-unitize Loran Manatee when it came under sanction. So the Venezuelans agreed, go ahead and pursue Manatee without the Loran side. That too was remarkable political negotiation and an achievement for Trinidad and Tobago. So today, you have one of the largest companies in the world, McDermott, saying they've been granted the contract, they've been awarded the contract by Shell, and we're proceeding with Manatee. And I expect in a very short time frame, we will hear about FID from Shell for Manatee. So let us not pretend that that work hasn't gone on because it has and that manatee gas will come. Loran, a few weeks ago, as I will mention in a while, when we, I signed that contract on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago at the end of September, in front of President Maduro with the Minister of Energy, I said at the time, as much as I could say, because every single one of these contracts contains confidentiality clauses, especially on pricing. I said at that stage, this is more than drag on. So we have already begun to look at the Loran side. And for Venezuela, it is the first time that they are offshore gas, looking to export offshore gas in this type of arrangement. So again, you're doing things in that context. This OFAC license that this motion is about, when the United States put sanctions, the only people who can give permission for you to operate without you attracting sanctions. And the truth is, there are two categories of sanctions. There's the first level and the second level, secondary. It is the Americans and American citizens, American companies who attract the sanctions at the first level. We are at the second level. So we don't easily attract those, but it is a huge risk and no one will do business whilst that is taking place. I hear a lot of talk about the amount of trips that are made to the United States and to Venezuela. It is for a singular purpose. The only purpose of those trips is that we were always advocating on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago for a future for Trinidad and Tobago. And thankfully, thankfully, it has met with a great measure of success. You will recall the Prime Minister in one of his transparent press conferences not too long ago, saying that it is as though you are pushing a boulder up a hill Fortunately, a few days later, a few weeks later, the end of September, we got the license from, we got the agreement from Venezuela. You would recall, and I'm reminding the population that every step of the way, as we make progress, and I'll give a quick history here, as we make progress, those on the other side try to undermine it, they try to pull it down, they ridicule it. In 2016, we began in earnest pursuing Dragon. The first thing we did, as you do in these arrangements, is sign a government-to-government -government agreement. We signed one with the government of Venezuela. For the first time, they were prepared to export gas out of the Dragon field. We then spent time negotiating, and let me answer Senator Vera's concern, which is a legitimate one. I don't act on behalf of NGC. I don't act on behalf of Shell. I am an elected representative of the people of Trinidad and Tobago for constituency, and that is who I'm acting on behalf of the government. At no point in time do I have the authority to negotiate on behalf of NGC or Shell, and nor would I dare do so. I am there to provide guidance. I am there because I am the government representative who negotiates with the governments. So when, as I will tell you in a short while, I made eight trips to the United States last year, several of them with the Prime Minister, it was pursuing this business. So when I sit in the Department of State, or the Department of Energy, or the Department of Agriculture, which was part of our strategy, recognizing that we are a huge producer of ammonia that is needed in the world, 
post the Russia-Ukraine crisis and war, that is the strategy we're implementing on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. This is not Vikivai, this is not wake up in the morning. And we pursued that, and I am sitting as a representative of the government, a representative of you, the people, saying Trinidad and Tobago has something the rest of the world doesn't have. And I said it on international TV as well. At the time, people didn't understand. Trinidad and Tobago has immediate capacity to produce LNG, ammonia, urea, UAN, which are all fertilizer based on unnecessary and methanol. And we're next to proven reserves, 17 kilometers of pipeline away in Venezuela. And that is what picked up traction. So when Europe and other countries need LNG and ammonia, we have an immediate solution, not today for today, but we will fill a big global void in the need for LNG, ammonia, urea, UAN, if we get access to proven reserves of gas that is 17 kilometers of pipeline that can be do done in a very short time frame in the scheme of things. So you will recall when I went on CNN International with Richard Quest, that was the message. At the time it was not understood, but it was part of the strategy and it was understood where it needed to be because we ended up with an OFAC license that no one else has. And that is part of the delivery from the very careful strategy for Trinidad and Tobago. You will recall in 2016, we negotiated that first memorandum of understanding. Very quickly in 2018, we had a commercial term sheet. We had agreed with Venezuela the price of gas, the allocation of gas, and that gas was set to come to Trinidad and Tobago by 2020. The next thing that happened, unfortunately in the world of geopolitics, as small as we are, we are caught between Venezuela and the United States. Sanctions came under a certain US administration that shut that down. Otherwise, the gas would have been here in 2020 and we would be having a completely different discussion. Fortunately, we didn't stop there. We then negotiated, well, let us deal with Manatee on our side. We've been pursuing deep water gas with Woodside and formerly BHP, and we continued. But we did not give up hope on Dragon. I remember the headlines, Dragon cannot dance, making mockery. I remember in the middle of sanctions when a sovereign government, this, sorry, this government recognized along with the rest of CARICOM based on the UN Charter that there was one president in Venezuela. The UN General, General Secretary, after a visit from CARICOM leaders, Dr. Rowley, P Prime Minister Motley, and the Prime Minister then of St. Kitts and Nevis, who went to the UN when they saw what was happening between Venezuela and the United States and went to the UN General, General Secretary, the UN said they recognized one leader in Venezuela, and it was not President Guaido. Today, history has proved us correct by sticking to principles, and that is the UN principles of non-intervention, non-interference. There is no President Guaido. We stuck with those principles that come from the UN, but we could not pursue the deal because the operators, Shell would go nowhere near it because of fear of sanctions. We did not give up. We very quietly came up with a strategy that we implemented as soon as possible, a change of administration in the United States, all of the time maintaining our relationship with Venezuela. When we were in the middle of um, COVID and our borders were closed, and the Vice President of Venezuela, who remains the Vice President today, Delcy Rodriguez, wrote to us diplomatically and said, I would like to come to Trinidad and Tobago, and I, as the Minister of National Security, on the advice of the Prime Minister allowed the Vice President of Venezuela to come to Trinidad and Tobago. The opposition led the charge on behalf of President Guaido, who they don't know where he is today, to say that the Prime Minister, they wrote to the United States government that Prime Minister Keith Rowley and Stuart Young should be sanctioned. That is the behavior of the opposition to undermine what is being done for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We pressed on. In 2022, we made our way very quietly. I started going to Washington, finding the right lawyers. How can we get a waiver from sanction so we can pursue Dragon? Because we know what is coming down the road and there's this need for this feedstock of natural gas. 
the Prime Minister made trips along with myself, accompanying him to Washington, D.C. We met with people on both sides of the house. We met with the most <laughs> vociferous advocates against Venezuela in the Senate, who have been in the headlines in the news within recent times. We met with Republicans, we met with Democrats, we met with members of the Department of Treasury, the Department of State, Department of Energy, Agriculture, a whole variety. You heard the Prime Minister say a few days ago, he gave five speeches in one day. It is true to advocate that must allow Trinidad and Tobago as a sovereign and as a friend of the United States to pursue this natural gas proven reserves into our existing capacity. It culminated in June of last year at the Summit of the Americas, meeting with President Biden and Vice President Harris. They listened, and so we began furthering it. In January of this year, we were the first country, and we are not the only ones who want to pursue the Venezuelan resources along with them, but we were the first to get a license in January of this year. What was the attitude of those on the other side and the opposition, unfortunately? after a short while of silence and being in shock that we now had authority to go ahead as a result of this OFAC waiver, oh, you can't pay for the gas in cash, so Maduro wouldn't accept it. I can tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago here today, through you, Mr. Spe Mr. President, in 2018, 2019, I visited Venezuela on the instructions of the Prime Minister a number of times. In 2022, the majority of the visits were to the United States, but still made four visits to Venezuela. And that is to maintain the relationships, to make sure that the people of Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela benefit down the road. For this year, 2023, I've made a total of 10 trips to Venezuela. And at the start in January, when we got the OFAC license, the cry of the opposition was, oh, it wouldn't happen because they can't pay in cash. Again, silence. We worked quietly, we continued our conversations with Venezuela, continued the negotiations, and on, on the 8th of March of this year, 2023, and the 15th of September, 23, 2023, we made applications on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, because again, your government, always being strategic, applied for the license, not on behalf of any company, no matter the companies that wanted, we applied for it as the government of Trinidad and Tobago to give us the room if we needed to change operators to be able to do so, even though we were under pressure to have joint applications with companies. The license from the United States to Trinidad and Tobago is to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So in January, we got the first one, 24th of January. Who is it that told the world was the first to tell the world about the license. The Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, he had a press conference. We were discussing it with the White House. We were discussing it with the highest levels of the American government. And we had agreed a time for the press conference and the Prime Minister announced what had happened as a result of diplomacy by your government and negotiations by your government. We then made two further applications for amendments and on the 17th of October of this year, we were granted an amendment that allows us to pay in cash, to pay in different currencies if necessary for the gas. Because of course, that was the cry of the opposition at the time. Remember, they wanted us to be sanctioned. They were saying you couldn't do it, President Guaido, who no longer exists. And now the cry was, well, the car proceed because your car pay for the gas in cash. Well, we did what we had to, very quietly, very efficiently, with competence, got the license amended. And now the license expires for Trinidad and Tobago on the 31st of October, 2025. It is not the general license that expires in April. And unfortunately, I cannot answer with the level of detail the question that Senator Vera just asked, what happens if Venezuela doesn't do certain things? I can tell you that up to a few weeks ago, the White House reached out to me and had a conversation with me and gave me a good sense of assurance. But I can't put anything, not a fingernail on a block for anything, because none of it is in my control. But I'm not going to stop and wait. I'm going to press on for the people of Trinidad and Tobago as we are doing. Minister, you have five more minutes. Thank you. So, Mr. President, one of the simple points is at every step that the government can tell the population anything we have come forth and we've told you, we can't disclose pricing because right now pricing is in the middle of negotiation. 
negotiations, and nor will we, when we get the license from Venezuela, be able to talk about pricing. Because you just can't do that in these contexts. But what I can tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago without fear of contradiction is working along with the technocrats at the Ministry of Energy, working along with the experts at the National Gas Company, and the whole global organization of Shell, their traders, and everyone, we are negotiating the right types of pricing for it to make sense for Trinidad and Tobago. So to answer that other red herring, no, I don't decide pricing. I don't decide term sheets, etc. They are experts who do that. But somebody has to be respected at the helm. Somebody has to be respected to lead the discussions and the negotiations. And I do it with the technocrats. So on the last visits, when we're gone to negotiate, you have the president of NGC, you have the commercial manager, you have the lawyers, you have the permanent secretary from the Ministry of Energy, you have Shell and a whole team that has been put together by Shell globally to negotiate this. And they are the ones doing the work as to where we move the pressure points. But you need someone who as a result of respect and a relationship with the government of Venezuela can walk into the door and through the door and have those discussions. And again, with full transparency, we have nothing to hide. They put it out on national TV. We leave that to them. At every step that we can say something, I give the people of Trinidad and Tobago the assurance we will, but there are going to be certain aspects. We cannot get into the details. For example, you have heard us talk about, and me in particular and the Prime Minister talk about the one deal that the UNC negotiated between 10 to 15 in the energy sector that up to today is still costing NGC billions of dollars annually because it is a bad deal. I have never called the name of the company. I have never said what is the pricing of gas that the UNC agreed to that is so disastrous for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. You can't do those things because you have to protect the reputation and the integrity of Trinidad and the sanctity of contract, but you could try to negotiate you could try to renegotiate as we have done. So, Mr. De Mr. President, as I come to a close, I give the people of Trinidad and Tobago the assurance that we will continue to do, no matter how difficult it is, what is necessary for future for Trinidad and Tobago. And part of that future must include a cross-border gas which is what we have been pursuing. I told you the Loran Manatee is on the table. We are doing Manatee. That gas is coming. We are pursuing Dragon after Dragon. It may very well be Manatee next, and there are other initiatives we have begun discussions on. And I'd like to say to the population through you, Mr. President, that anyone who wants this type of information out in the public domain falls into a category of you, you have to be careful not to be irresponsible for the reasons I've set out. You don't know what you're talking about is another category. Or, worst case, and I don't ascribe this to anyone, you could want to destroy the future for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And what I find remarkable is there is no genuine interest by those who have brought this motion to see a better energy sector, a better Trinidad and Tobago. It is all these snide comments and all these snide remarks always looking to undermine. How could you write to the United States when your government is following UN principles of non-interference, non-intervention, and say, sanction the prime minister and the minister because they've allowed the vice president of a country in? Run to the OAS to get the OAS to say we're in breach of the Rio Treaty, which we were not in breach of. And as the record reflects, I stood right here in the Senate when I answered that question that was misquoted, unfortunately, and that was jumped on by the Americans, but they later accepted that there was no breach of the Rio Treaty and all of that hullabaloo was for nothing. So Mr. President, the simple point is, points are as follows. We will provide the information as soon as it is available and as soon as we are permitted to as we have done. Look at the record. You will see immediately when I was notified on the 17th of October that we had been granted an amendment that allowed us to pay in cash, I reached out to the Prime Minister who was actually in Ottawa in Canada 
And he said, go ahead and tell the population immediately rather than it leaks from somewhere. We will provide the information, and I can assure you that we are negotiating and fighting hard in different countries for what is best for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. President, I thank you. Senator Maharaj. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to 